This is a physics and math series from old Doc Kohler. It's called The History of Vector Analysis and some stuff on the philosophy of mathematics. This is episode one, introduction. You are here. Hello, I am old Doc Kohler. Welcome to the first episode of my ungodly long YouTube series on the history of vector analysis. This is the episode in which I tell you what I'm going to tell you then I'm going to spend about 20 episodes telling you, and then I will spend one last episode telling you what I think I told you. If you are an undergraduate college student taking a course in physics, great. You are one of the tens and tens of people who are in my target audience. Everyone else, I don't know, get off my lawn? Um, seriously, uh, everyone is welcome, but I'm mostly going to be talking to the physics majors. If you want to find out more about me and my overall goals for this channel, there is a channel overview presentation that should address the who and the why of me and my target audience of troubled physics majors. But enough about me. Why did I pick the history of vector analysis as the subject of this series? Well, the idea started out somewhat arbitrarily as an overview of electricity and magnetism, or e &M for short. Within e &M, I rather naturally gravitated toward the heart of the subject, uh, Maxwell's equations, so I thought I'd start there. Here they are on a t-shirt. I'll state that I never personally owned one of these, but I confess that back in the day I did own some that were just as nerdy. Um, but before you can talk about the physics that these equations represent, uh, you sort of have to talk about the mathematical concepts of the divergence and the curl, del dot and del cross. They're right in there so you can't put them off. Divergence and curl, as you probably know if you are watching this, are part of the mathematical subject of vector analysis. This is now the official language of classical e &M, and it shows up in a lot of other places as well. So, how much to say about vector analysis? At first I thought I would do what pretty much every e &M textbook does and just use the first episode, maybe two, um, uh, on a series on, say, Maxwell's equations to go over the basics of vectors, you know, which most of you have been using since high school anyway. Here, for example, uh, is the table of contents of a popular junior-senior level undergraduate e &M textbook, Griffiths. Chapter one, right here, is vector analysis. A quick little review, and then we move on to the real stuff, right? Kind of like warming up with stretching before we go on our cross-country run. All right, before we go any further, I, I do want to go on record as saying that I like this textbook a lot. It was way better than the one that I used. So anything that sounds like criticism going forward is not aimed at this book, or even in the way e &M is taught in general. Like all subjects in college, there is a vast amount of material to be covered in a semester. It's the nature of the beast. Thus, every hour you spend on vector analysis is an hour that you can't spend on magnetic fields in matter or electromagnetic waves, okay? I get it. Having said that, one of the lessons that I finally learned in grad school, a little bit too late for me, uh, is that chapter one of any physics textbook is the most important chapter in the book. Chapter one is presented as review, but don't be deceived. Physics as a, as a subject is very hierarchical. When you take course 311, it will be assumed that you have mastered everything in course 111. To be courteous about it, the textbook authors give you chapter one. This is them putting you on notice that they will assume that you know everything in chapter one upside down and backwards. As the expression goes, this will be your only warning. Vectors, as you know from high school, start out pretty easy. Uh, magnitude and direction, and they follow geometrically straightforward rules for addition and subtraction. Things get a little weird with the cross product, uh, but it's a rule, okay? You, you plug in the numbers and it works. Uh, divergence and curl, as well as the integral equations like Stokes' theorem and the divergence theorem start to get a little messy, but hey, you did pretty well on all those subjects and you've got all this stuff mastered, right? You've seen this all before and you got it, right? Besides chapter one, another thing to note the existence of in the table of contents are the appendices. Now, I have never taken a course in which an appendix was actually made aside reading, okay? But like chapter one, there is an implicit assumption on the part of the authors that you know the material or at least can learn it on your own. 
Okay, this material is fundamental, but there isn't really time to cover it in this course. So, hey, don't say we didn't put it in the book somewhere. Okay. In fact, the textbook uh, you used in your freshman, sophomore ENM may very well have covered, say, the Helmholtz equation, perhaps right around page 550. All right, unfortunately, your course only made it through page 400, but moving on. Okay, that said, uh, I will add that even if you know everything in chapter one and all of the appendices backward and forwards, the fact is, is that vector analysis is actually a lot weirder than you may have been led to believe. For example, you probably know that the cross product is not commutative. A cross B is not equal to B cross A, although it is anti-commutative, which in practice is almost as good. Still, what does it mean that an operation that is central to so many physics problems doesn't behave itself? This is telling us something. Well, it gets worse. The cross product, it turns out, does not even come close to obeying the associative property. You can see this for yourself by considering i cross j cross j. If you do the j cross j first, you get zero, and i cross zero equals zero. But if you do the i cross j first, i cross j equals k, and k cross j equals negative i. Not the same. Okay, what do textbooks have to say about this? Well, they have this to say about this. It's the famous back cab rule, uh, which is one of the vector identities that's out there. So the cross product is not associative. Okay, move along, folks. Nothing to see here. Just use this expression instead. But um, still, you're sort of left with this sense of we use the back cab rule because we can't use the associative property. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? It turned out that I wasn't the only one back in the day who uh, was bothered by the rules, the basic rules of mathematics that vectors did not obey. Um, here are some quotes from the book I use as a primary resource for this series. The quote, taken slightly out of context, refers to how major figures in the mathematical community at the time responded to vector analysis when it first appeared in the 1880s and 1890s. Overly pragmatic, algebraically crude, highly arbitrary. Textbooks generally allow the student to believe, okay, via omission, that vector analysis was the obvious solution to the physical problems that arose and were probably introduced by Maxwell, Maxwell's equations and all that, and were completely non-controversial when they appeared. None of this is true. Okay, but uh, one might say that the history of vector analysis doesn't matter. It's what we use now. It works. So let's move on. We've got a lot of ground to cover before the final exam. My rationalization for making this series is that I believe that understanding the history of how vector analysis came to be the language of E&M can give you uh, insight and perspective on both the math and the physics. Unfortunately, the use of those terms, insight and perspective, pretty much means that this series is not going to help you with the problem set that's due the day after tomorrow. So if that's what you're looking for, quit goofing off and get back to work. Okay, uh, what I hope that this series can offer you is context, the ability to see the forest for the trees so that you don't have to spend quite so much time as the semester wears on barking up the wrong ones. Something to watch over the weekend, something to ponder and reflect on before you go out with your friends for a little well-deserved R&R. &R. That's the idea anyway. Here is the maze, my primary metaphor for this YouTube channel. The maze represents the vast subject that you are studying. It could represent all of E&M, or in this case, just a portion of chapter one on vector analysis. Okay. The point is that there's way too much material to cover in a semester, perhaps even too much material to cover in a lifetime. So the textbook and the professor guide you down one particular path through the maze, one that hopefully connects the endpoints. In this metaphor, I am trying to put you in the shoes of those who trod these paths for the first time and who didn't know what the correct path was or were unsatisfied with the path that their predecessors had wandered down. Uh, it's also to show you uh, some of the regions off of the textbook path where there be dragons. Um, this is not because I believe that there is a better way through. It is to help you appreciate the context of the official path to see it from a different perspective. Here is the high-level description for how this series is going to play out. 
I'm going to begin with the history of complex numbers. This may seem like an odd, unrelated choice, but it's not. It turns out that complex numbers expressed in the 2D complex plane are, in fact, the first vectorial system and the one that inspired the others. Next up is quaternions, a strange 4D mathematical construction that is still used today in a few places. The major names here will be William Rowan Hamilton and Peter Guthrie Tate. I will then change gears and talk briefly about the dawn of classical field theory. This is because, in the hands of James Clerk Maxwell, the mathematical description of Faraday's electric and magnetic fields became the motivation for bringing quaternions into mainstream physics. Then comes the plot twist. Josiah Willard Gibbs and Oliver Heaviside, two guys from very different worlds, come up with very similar modifications to quaternions to make them easier for physicists and engineers to work with. Modifications is an understatement. They basically cut the heart out of quaternions, and the term easier is also a relative one. Now, I'm sure that a bunch of potential viewers were scared off when they saw this chart up front, the list of actual episodes. Why so many? Okay, there's two reasons for this. The first is that, as a viewer of YouTube videos myself, I know that more shorter videos are better than fewer longer videos. It's like breaking a novel up into chapters. You know, a place to pause or quit for the day makes things easier. Um, I have tried my best to keep each episode at 15 minutes or less, although I haven't always succeeded. The second reason is the answer to the question, okay, why is the entire series so long? Couldn't you cover the history of vectors in, say, 45 minutes total? Well, yes, I could have, and I probably would have if I were getting paid to do this by a direction from management or some paying client to, you know, get to the point. Okay, But I'm old now, so I just let this thing go where it wanted to go, and then I formalized it. So this seems to be where it wanted to go. We'll see if it works. Next, let me introduce my primary reference for this series. It is called, unsurprisingly, A History of Vector Analysis, and it is written by a real historian of mathematics named Michael J. Crow. This book is not new, but it is something of a classic. It first appeared in 1967 and was, and still is, considered to be the definitive history of the subject, or at least one of them. Every newer book on the history of vector analysis tags this book as a reference. Here is my well-used copy. Yes, I have read the entire thing, most parts of it, multiple times. I have lots of underlines and notes in the margins. Um, this, by the way, is a Dover paperback. Dover Publications does the world a great service, in my opinion. They buy up the publishing rights to, among other subjects, important math and science books that have gone out of print and then reproduce them on high-quality materials for reasonable prices. I own a lot of Dover books, and I have read many of them. <laughs> All right, uh, a couple of notes from the beta testers before I end this episode. Uh, the first is that I have had some complaints that I talk too fast, especially uh, when it comes time to the technical stuff. There, it turns out that YouTube has a fabulous solution to this. Here is a video from the site Kathy Loves Physics and History. How could I not be a fan? Okay. If you want to slow the video down, this is an easy thing to do. You find the, the settings icon, that thing that looks like a gear, and you click on playback speed, which is now set to normal, and you click here and you make it slower or faster if you want. You click on 0 0.75 and suddenly Kathy is talking more slowly. Brilliant! Second. I got asked if my background was real or a green screen. It's real! Look, these are real books here. Look, this is real art. Okay, that's it for the introductory episode. The next episode will start to the actual history of vector analysis, starting with, of all things, history of imaginary numbers. See you then!